We're talking today with Robert Polin, author of Contours of Dissent, U.S. Economic Fractures and the Landscape of Global Austerity. Robert, thank you for coming in today. Well, thanks very much for having me, Mike. Let me start out and ask you if you could uh, begin by giving us a brief bio of yourself. Uh, well, I teach economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I've been there, uh, this is my sixth year, and before that I taught for a long time at uh, University of California, Riverside. So I know the West Coast well. Uh, I am uh, an academic and teacher but uh, and do academic research, but I've also been engaged in uh, policy, very direct policy-related work, including uh, around the issues of living wages. And my previous book was about living wages and, and how to implement them in different cities. Uh, this book is more about the, the U.S. and global economy in a broader sense. I've also done work around these issues about the U.S. economy, the overall uh, economy, and the overall global economy. In fact, right now I'm just starting a new project under the UN uh, trying to develop alternative economic policies to promote jobs in South Africa. So that gives you a, a general sense of, of what I've been doing. All right, and what was the motivation with coming out with Contours of Dissent? Well, uh, the, uh, the kernel of the book uh, was actually a paper an academic paper that I wrote for a conference, I was asked to write a paper evaluating the Clinton economy um, while it was still going on. This was towards the end of the Clinton years. This was uh, uh, January 2000, so he still had another year in office. Um, at the time, uh, the Clinton economy was very, very broadly extolled as being a huge success along every single dimension. Economic growth was improving more jobs, low inflation, and of course, uh, incredibly booming stock market, and the, and the government uh, finances had been transformed from deficits to surpluses. And so uh, this was regarded as an enormous achievement in and of itself, and it also was regarded as affirming what Clinton himself called the third way in economic policy. And the first way um, is what you could call the old New Deal, Great Society type Democratic Party approach, which was heavily focused on well-being of, of working people and the poor, supportive of trade unions, and that was the coalition of the Democratic Party. And the second way was what you could call the far right wing free market approach of, of Reagan and so forth, and, and Margaret Thatcher in Britain. And, and Clinton was supposed to have carved out a third way between those options. And other uh, governments throughout the world uh, were also following this so-called third way approach. And the, the Clinton economy was regarded as the, as the uh, shining example of how the third way worked. Well, I wrote my paper and I said, well, actually this model is not working. Um, what we are seeing is, is an illusion. Or as I say in my book, the chapter is called Clintonomics, the hollow boom. Uh, so the, that was the kernel of, of the book, that paper. And um, by the time I got started writing the book, Clinton was out of office and Bush had come into office. So of course I wanted to pick up the story and talk about economic policy under Bush and, and the state of the economy, even though even today, obviously Bush is is still doing his thing. It's still a, a Bush economy. So that was the basic structure of the book until September 11th, um, 2001. And at that point, um, immediately after the terrorist attacks, most people forget this, but um, Colin Powell, uh, a lot of other commentators, and even George Bush himself said, uh, we, we need to focus more on fighting global poverty uh, because hope is the answer to terror. That was, in fact, the term that George Bush, Bush used. So uh, ha having immersed myself in this book about the U.S. economy, it was also, it seemed incumbent on me, certainly after September 11th, to consider the ways in which U.S. economic policies were affecting global poverty. Uh, and so that's really the, th the third prong of the book, to understand the nature of global poverty. And in fact, 
the ways in which U.S. policies and, and the policies that they advance through the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization are actually deepening, not improving uh, conditions for the world's poor. And then finally, having done all that, I wanted to also end on a positive note and say, you know, it's not like there are no alternatives out there. There are, and there are alternatives that are actually workable today with our given political structure and, and policy apparatus. And so the last chapter of the book, which I actually pick up from the, the uh, global anti-globalization movement that really got launched here in Seattle, which another world is possible, was the, was the term. And I, uh, my last chapter is called Another Path is Possible. So that's really how the book all came together. Perhaps we can start with uh, the paper that actually launched, or the ideas behind the paper that actually launched the book then. Right. I have often suspected that the um, economy as it was presented during Clinton's time wasn't quite as rosy as what uh, my television set told me. Right. Can you go into that and right. explain uh, the, well, the truth behind it was that? Well, it was a really interesting experience writing that initial paper, because here I am, a you know professional economist i do this stuff on a daily basis i teach i write papers but given the assignment to just kind of pull together some basic things about what's going on in clinton i mean i kind of had a vague sense like you did that of of you know that things weren't as good as as what the tv or what the new york times was telling me but in actually pulling together the data that are in the book and were in my paper i really uh, just kind of felt this visceral anger uh, because it was very easy to back up, you know, the vague sense that I had and, and, and you had and a lot of other people had that uh, the Clinton economy really was not uh, a success along s several basic dimensions. Um, number one, the notion that the economy was growing faster than it had in generations it's just false, it, and, and I show the data, you know, simple government data, it's right in the book. The, you know, the, the growth of the economy was, was mediocre. Um, it was better than it had been under George Bush the first, but it was not better than it was, for example, under Nixon or Carter. So uh, it's, it's not like, the, just on, by this basic measure, it wasn't like economic growth was any major success. Secondly, what we really ca care about, of course, is the well-being of people. Um, the average wage of, of the non-supervisory workers uh, under Clinton uh, never really rose until the last two years of his uh, term in office. So the workers' well-being, uh, just by that measure, was not improving. Poverty. The poverty statistics show, and these are just, I, I have actually a lot of disagreements with the way poverty is measured in this country, but let's just take the, the standard measure that the government puts out. There was really no improvement at all in, lessen, in lessening poverty under Clinton relative to Ronald Reagan and George Bush, number one. And they were, of course, denounced as being harsh and uncaring for the poor and, and advancing programs that were terrible for the poor. Well, that was true. And that therefore what we would expect, especially if we're having a booming economy under Clinton, and he's a Democrat, and he's a guy who goes around saying, well, I'm, I'm the first black president. I'm committed. And he has an office in Harlem now and all that stuff. Well, things actually never got better. They didn't get worse. But you would expect in eight years that there would be some significant improvement that didn't occur, and I document that in the book. So those are the, the basic things. Now, to the extent that there was improvement in, in growth, and there, you know, it was better than under George Bush the first, the other part of the story is that almost all of that was due to the stock market, the bubble on the stock market, the highly speculative financial markets that Clinton and Alan Greenspan pretty much waved along and were cheerleaders for. And actually, in my initial paper that was published before Clinton left office, if I may be a little bit vain, I did predict at the end of that paper that the, that the stock market was going to crash and the financial market was highly fragile. Uh, it was obvious. It, in fact, Alan Greenspan himself knew full well that was what was going on, didn't do anything about it. 
Uh, and so that the, the growth that did occur, and there were some gains, in the last, especially the last two years under Clinton, unemployment did fall, and that even though wages uh, were still low, the unemployment rate was very low, but that, that growth spurt was almost entirely due to the stock market. So it was this highly fragile situation that was bound to collapse, and of course it did collapse. It, colla- it started to collapse even the last couple months of Clinton's term in office. So uh, the Clinton uh, uh, administration really did hand over an, a mess to Bush. Not that Bush did anything uh, to improve the situation, but that's my overall assessment of the Clinton economy, that it did not help ordinary people, didn't help working people and the poor. Uh, it certainly did help people at the very top. There was this massive redistribution of income upwards under Clinton, a Democrat. And if I can just cite one statistic, the ratio of the average wage um, to the average corporate CEO, okay, that's basic statistic. In, in 1970, Nixon was still in office. The average CEO made 30 times more than the average worker. Okay. By the end of George Bush the first in 1993, the, this ratio had risen. The average corporate CEO made 113 times more than the average worker. That's 1993. By 2001, when Clinton stepped down, the average corporate CEO was making 449 times more than the average worker. So a lot of people love the Clinton years. It's obvious why. And they, of course, have control over most of the media. And so that was the story that was coming out. That was the feel-good story. It did feel good for those people. What's the, uh, the ratio now? Do you know? Uh, it's probably uh, about where it was in, in 2001, uh, 449 to 1. Um, I actually haven't calculated it since 2001. We probably only have one more year of data because it takes a year or so to get the data. All right. You mentioned that you would use different, uh, perhaps, methods for measuring poverty. Yeah. What, uh, what would you propose for measuring poverty? Well, the problem with measuring poverty, and of course, measuring poverty is a very important thing that social scientists need to do well because uh, all the anti-poverty programs that we have, and they're not that generous, but there are some, are predicated on who you define as being poor. So how you measure that is important. The way poverty is measured in this country was based on a uh, 1963 methodology that might have been okay for 1963 because it was the first crack at it, but we haven't done anything with it since. And in 1963, the methodology was calculate what the most minimal basic food needs are for a person and a family, okay? Whatever that number is, figure out how much it costs in dollars, and then multiply that number by three. That's the poverty line, period. And that's that's it. Now, uh, it it's not it might not be disastrously bad if we assume that all the other things that poor people need to kind of keep themselves alive, that that the costs of those things don't increase relative to the costs of food. But what's actually happened is that other things have risen in cost relative to food. Housing has re- risen relative to food. And in particular, after Clinton signed the, the law to abolish welfare for mothers with children, the cost of child care went up dramatically relative to the cost of food. And so none of that is factored in in our poverty statistics. Uh, actually, the gov- a government agency, the National Re- uh, Research Council, did a major study on alternative ways to measure poverty, and they commissioned a lot of people, seven or eight experts. And those experts found that, according to their techniques, the poverty line should go up by somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. Um, so that's that's really indicating that you know that the poverty line is is just not adequate for capturing the needs of people. What about other units of measure like the GNP and GDP? Aren't those pretty outdated as well? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of problems with those, though I I use them in the book like everybody else does. I do do flag the problem at the beginning. 
one of the biggest problems with uh, GNP. GNP is supposed to measure everything everybody does for a living every day. That's GNP. And then you add it all up at the end of the year. That's a big pot of work that people have contributed. That's supposed to show everything that's going on. Uh, one of the major problems with that is that it, it doesn't take account of uh, the bad things that happen when we do when we produce goods and services. Uh, so it doesn't take account of environmental costs. Um, so if you're if you're producing chemicals in a chemical plant and you're dumping wastes into a river, that's not a subtraction of GDP. The the chemicals that you produce is an addition to GDP, but the destruction of the environment is not a subtraction. So that's a major major problem. Another major problem um, is that it doesn't take account of work done at the home. So and that that's of course especially important for people that are in, you know care about. Um, the w contributions of women, because most of the work at home is done by women, e whether or not they have jobs. So that, for example, if you, um, if you're taking care of your children and and uh, cooking your meals and cleaning your house, that's not counted as part of GNP. If you're rich and you hire somebody else to come into your house, take care of your children, clean the house, take care of the kids, that is part of GNP. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of anomalies and problems with our most basic measure of how the economy is performing, which is GNP or GDP. Yeah, I think there was a, a wonderful movie made about uh, Marilyn Waring called Who's Counting that went into uh, great detail about uh, yeah. the whole concept. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, you also brought up Alan Greenspan and that uh, he knew what was uh, coming for the stock market. He's a... a person that your average American, I think, knows very little about, yet uh, gets brought out as if he were the pope of right. the economy. Can that's you talk right. about him? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good term for him, the pope of the economy. In fact, uh, Bob Woodward, who, uh, you know, a long time ago achieved great fame as, as the one who uncovered the Watergate scandal along with Carl Bernstein as a outsider, uh, you know, uncovering what was going on in the machinations of the Nixon administration is now the total Washington insider. And uh, one of his more recent books was called Maestro. And it was about Alan Greenspan as the person that was doing everything to make our lives better. And I, I have some quotes in the book that Alan Greenspan is, is, a, is the seer that knows everything and is fixing everything for everybody. Well, of course, his reputation has suffered a bit. He probably would have been better off in terms of the history books if he had, if he'd left, uh, you know, along with Clinton, and then the, his successor could have taken the blame for the collapse of the stock market. Now, Alan Greenspan uh, knew; uh, it's fully documented, and I go through some of the evidence in my book. Uh, Alan Greenspan knew full well that the stock market was a dangerous bubble. We know this because uh, there was a meeting of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, which is the powerful organization that runs the Federal Reserve that Alan Greenspan is the head of. And at the meeting of September the 24th, 1996, Greenspan is confronted by Larry Lindsay, who was an, one of the governors who later became George Bush II's chief economic advisor until he got fired. Uh, but Lindsay, who is a very conservative economist, said, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Greenspan, it looks like we have a bubble economy here and, and maybe we should do something about it. And Greenspan says, and we have the minutes of the meeting now because they released them five years after the actual meetings occurred. Greenspan says, you're right, we do have a bubble and I know what to do about it or I know how to fix it. And basically, the solution is what, what you call raise the margin requirements. And the margin requirements is how much, if somebody's borrowing money to buy stocks, how much, if you, if you borrow a dollar, uh, the margin requirement is how much of that you get to use to buy a stock and how much you have to hold in cash. So let's say you borrow a dollar, the margin requirement might say you have to hold 50 cents in cash and you can only use 50 cents to buy a stock. Uh, and so uh, Greenspan said, I can stop the bubble by raising the margin requirement. So instead of saying you have to hold 50 cents in cash, you have to hold 70 cents in cash. 
uh, and that would slow down the, the uh, bubble. And it would also signal to the stock market that, you know, you guys are out of control. So Greenspan is on record saying, I know how to stop the bubble. Does he do anything about it? No, never did anything about it. And in fact, he participated along with the Clinton administration in actually deregulating the financial market and letting, therefore letting the, the stock traders do more and more of uh, highly speculative uh, financing, which then led to the collapse of the bubble. So Greenspan knew this. And uh, the, the notion that Greenspan was the maestro um, was predicated on the bubble continuing and, and some people making money hands over fists over what was just a, um, you know, a pyramid of sand that was about to collapse. And he knew that. He didn't do anything about it. Any insights on why he would, wouldn't have done anything about that? Well, uh, the, the basic reason, and he's been very defensive about it, was ever since the the minutes came out of that 1996 meeting and some journalists have written about this and Greenspan's given some various explanations as to what was what he was doing and thinking and his, you know and his basic argument is who am I to sit and say that I know better than the market you know the market know, is all knowing these are very smart people why should I stop what they want to do uh, that's his explanation I, the real explanation is a variation on that which is the market is very powerful. People are making tons of money off of uh, borrowing and speculating and driving stock prices to a level in excess of what it was in 1929. It's the biggest stock market bubble in the history of the United States. And I, again, I document that in the book. Um, and Greenspan wasn't, it was afraid of them, basically. He didn't want to curry their uh, displeasure. So, and neither did Clinton. And the fact is, that was the main thing they had going for them. I mean, all this whole hoopla about how the Clinton and Greenspan were geniuses uh, creating this whole, quote, new economy, that was the term, was almost all uh, based on the stock market boom and how much money people were making off of it. So th they, they didn't have the guts to do anything about it is the answer. But isn't his role to kind of be a governor or regulator of the economy and indirectly, isn't he supposed to serve the American people as opposed to those people that are running Wall Street? Yes, uh, he is the most powerful economic regulator in the country and almost and by extension in the world. I mean, to the extent any one person has power over economic policy, it is Alan Greenspan. Um, but, you know, we live in a society in which the people with a lot of money and power uh, exercise uh, excessive influence over what goes on in the economy. I have an interesting qu quote on that um, because this came out in the, um, in the early days of the Clinton administration because Clinton was uh, elected on a platform that was called Putting People First. And uh, putting people first meant, uh, as they expressed it, was that they were going to invest in infrastructure and schools and so forth. Well, that all changed uh, very quickly um, after he was elected, even before he took office. Uh, even before he took office, uh, he uh, basically appointed Robert Rubin, who was a, a big Wall Street person, the head of Goldman Sachs, as his chief economic advisor. And Rubin and Greenspan got together and they decided on an agenda that was going to focus on the needs of, of Wall Street and the rich. And there is a debate within the Clinton uh, policy circles about this. And I just want to read you uh, one quote um, from this period uh, in which uh, I, I'm just discussing how, how, how could Clinton have undergone such a lightning reversal from the program on which he was elected to office of putting people first to the one that focused on the needs of Wall Street. Uh, and here I'm saying the answer was straightforward and explained with unvarnished candor by Robert Rubin, who had been co-chair of the premier Wall Street firm Goldman Sachs before cl joining the Clinton administration and who was to become Clinton's most influential economic advisor and treasury secretary. Still during the interregnum before Clinton's first inauguration, Rubin pointed out to members of the more populous camp within the newly forming administration that, that, quote, 
this is a quote, again from Bob Woodward's book, the rich are running the economy and make the decisions about the economy. So there you have it. You know, you know we're, we're the grown-ups. It's great you said all this stuff to get Clinton elected, but now we take over and we decide what's good for everybody. And that's basically what was the major theme throughout the Clinton years. Now, on a lot of levels, that's somewhat shocking to hear that, but isn't that partly because they just were you know, being upfront about that? Isn't that the way that uh, things have always kind of been run to a degree where the rich really steer the economy? Well, uh, yes, to various degrees. And I think we have to think about, um, in the longer term framework, you had a, a long period after the last stock market collapse and Great Depression in which the legitimacy of the rich running everything um, had also collapsed. And so you had the development of this was the New Deal in which it was still a capitalist economy and you still had inequality and you still had a stock market and you still had uh, big corporations, but the disparities were far less and you had a government which was explicitly um, in, engaged in acting as a counterforce to what the market would would uh, achieve left on its own. The, you know, the New Deal program was focused on very heavy regulation of the financial markets. Why? Because they, they had no legitimacy after the collapse in the 30s. You know, this notion that the financial markets actually know what they're doing, nobody believed it. Um, well, so you had a very heavy uh, system of financial regulation. The notion that the free market was going to create jobs for everybody, full employment, nobody believed it. So you needed a government to act as the counterforce. It was still a capitalist economy, but it was a more egalitarian form of capitalism. And I think part of the reason at that time also you did have uh, coming out of World War II, roughly one-third of the world's population living under what was called communism, though I, I'm very critical of the types of governments they had, but even at the level of rhetoric, uh, they were saying, we are, in, we are uh, concerned with equality. We're concerned with full employment. You capitalists, all you care about is the rich people getting rich. So there was also, even both the Democrats and the Republicans, and similarly in Europe, were, were focused on demonstrating that a capitalist economy could be one that there was some equality, that we did care about everybody, there was a sense of sol solidarity. And that was ne necessary as a means of competing with the, at least the rhetoric of communism. So, uh, but that all has eroded. And so that even, and this is part of the story of, of my book, by the time you get to Clinton, um, both the Democrats and the Republicans have moved so much more in the conservative direction toward, toward uh, uh, serving the interest primarily of the rich, that, that even the Democrats are, are more uh, solicitous of the well-being of the, of the rich and less caring about the av ordinary people and, and working people and the poor than the Republicans were 30 years ago. Uh, and you can see that in terms of you know, just basic statistics and stripping away the rhetoric. Uh, both the, the, the mainstream parties, the left and the right party, the Democrat and the Republican, have all shifted to the right so that you have someone like Robert Rubin could come in and just uh, lecture these people that you know, believed that Clinton's program was more egalitarian. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes we're, we'll do some things, but you know, we're running the economy and you know, the rich are running the economy and, and we know what we're doing. And, and first, we have to be served, and then maybe we'll take care of everybody else. And I think that's probably the, an, the overall theme of what happened under Clinton. Okay, so things weren't as rosy under Clinton as, uh, as the media presented to mm -hmm. us. And then Bush takes over, and it sounds like you have some agreement with, with their stance that they inherited a mess. I do. Okay. Uh, what happened is, of course, they didn't know it was a mess. Uh, George Bush was running for the presidency uh, touting his uh, so-called program of tax reforms, which was, always has been, is to this day, a program of tax cuts for the rich. That's, that was his agenda. Before September 11th, that was his entire agenda, as far as I can tell. He had no other, other than, you know, rhetoric, he had no serious uh, program 
uh, in terms of the economy or anything else other than basically making him and his friends better off with tax cuts and, and, and diminishing the public sector. Uh, so he had this agenda. Now, uh, there was never any reference as this tax cut program being a anti-recession policy or as a way to counteract the problems engendered by Clinton. Uh, but it was only actually at the after there was after the election, and they were still fighting over who won Clinton, uh, Gore or, or Bush, that uh, Dick Cheney went on Meet the Press, the Sunday talk show. And this was, I think, December the third, uh, two thousand, and he said, "We may be on the front end of a recession." Now the, the stock market had already started going down, but people had had been so. Uh, inured to the idea that we were in a new economy that with the internet and the surpluses and the low inflation uh, that Clinton had performed some miracle and the economy was you know never going to have another recession and when uh, when Cheney said that Clinton himself denounced it. how dare you say such a thing you know it can't possibly be true and then the economists under Clinton you know fell in step and they said the same thing and in fact very few people believe Cheney uh, but he was right and of course they had an, uh, an uh, agenda in saying that which was you know if it turns out there is a recession we don't want to take the blame we want to be able to blame Clinton and so uh, they started saying that. They're, they also had another uh, reason for saying that, which was to all of a sudden to revive their tax cut program now as a way to fight the recession. They said, well, we need tax cuts because that will stimulate the economy, which is just, it may well be turning into a recession. And we don't know for sure if there's going to be a recession, but just in case, as an insurance policy, let's cut taxes. Now... Uh, that was the way they introduced the idea of a recession. They were correct that a recession was coming. They were totally incorrect in advancing the idea that this tax cut policy that they favored would do anything at all to fight the recession. And of course, they really didn't care because they had already proposed the thing before they were even thinking about the recession. And all of a sudden, no matter what comes along, whatever comes down the pike, the, there's always one answer cut taxes for the rich. So you have economic growth, we want to keep it going, cut taxes for the rich. You have a recession, oh, cut taxes for the rich. September 11th, a national emergency. We've got the solution, cut taxes for the rich. That's been their program all along at every phase. Now, at the very first thing that uh, Bush did on taking office was, uh, was put forward his tax cut program, more or less as he had advanced it on the campaign trail. Uh, the only problem is an anti-recession policy. He's saying, we ha you know, we're, we're on the front edge of a recession. It's 2001. Let's do these tax cuts. It'll give more m money back to people, and then they'll spend it. That'll fight the recession. Only problem with that is that none of the tax cuts, I mean, zero, 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 uh, none of the tax cuts were going to take place in 2001 the year the recession was, was occurring. So how is that going to fight the recession? I mean, if you follow their logic saying, to fight the recession, we need tax cuts. Well, then why would you want tax cuts in the future, in 2002, 2004, up through 2010, when the recession is occurring in 2001? It's obvious that the real aim was just to cut taxes for the rich, not to fight a recession. It turned out the one that passed the Democrats, weak as they are and timid as they are, they did manage to get some tax cuts in in that initial bill in 2001. It was a very weak anti-recession policy, as we know, because it didn't stop the recession. But overall, they were right. And of course, they had a reason to argue it. It was in self-interest. They were right in saying that the Clinton economy uh, that they had inherited was a mess. Uh, the they, they've done everything that possible to make it worse, uh, but it is true that it's, it was a mess. Talk about um, neoliberalism and how it fits into this whole picture. Okay. Uh, well, when I was trying to uh, pull together the overall theme of the book, um, you know, a lot of people uh, are skeptical of the notion of me saying, oh, Clinton and Bush have uh, broadly similar 
agendas. I mean, obviously, there's there's differences, but in the way that the media treat these differences, we focus and blow up the differences, and we say, oh, you know, they, they, everything about them is completely different. In fact, uh, in my view, most things about them are broadly similar. Broadly similar in the sense that they both agree that as Robert Rubin said, the rich are running the economy and should run the economy. They both agree on that point. They disagree as to some of the details, and those details matter, but they both agree with that. And um, that, uh, uh, that approach to economic policy is a variant on, on what we would call, what a lot of people call neoliberalism. It's a somewhat confusing term, and my wife, uh, among other people, said, well, how come you use this term when, you know, ordinary people don't know what you mean? Well, it's it's actually a, a, a good term. And the reason is, is classical liberalism, the way the term actually emerged in political philosophy way back in the 18th century, classical liberalism basically was a free market philosophy. It meant laissez-faire, let people do what they want. And that was the idea that the markets could decide things better than government. And of course, as that idea merged, this was a very progressive idea because governments at that time were uh, feudal governments. These were, you know, these were kings deciding or feudal lords deciding. And so the idea under liberalism, classical liberalism, was that let people decide freely on their own and, and you'll get a, a, a better, fairer society. Um, so that's the the cle that's that's the pure notion of it. Neoliberalism, as the term has emerged in the last fifteen years, including in, in Seattle with those demonstrations against the WTO. Uh, neoliberalism is a variant on that, which says, you know, yes, cut back on government and let the corporations run things, or, or as Robert Rubin said, let the, let the rich run things. We know better. Uh, uh, the, the part that neoliberalism is distinct from the classical idea is that uh, people like Robert Rubin and people at the IMF don't really believe in letting the markets do things all the time. They believe in letting the markets do things when it helps them. They don't believe in letting the markets do things when it hurts them. They want, for example, they want government bailouts if, if the financial markets are collapsing. They want Alan Greenspan to come in and prop things up. If, for example, you know, the Mexican financial markets are collapsing and the U.S. investors have a lot of money, they don't say, oh, let the, mar let the free market work. Uh, you know, no pain, no gain. You know, let, let us take our losses and next time we'll know better. They don't say that. They do say that when it comes to things like you know, labor standards. Uh, or union laws uh, regarding unions uh, or laws regarding environmental policy. They say, you know, having the government in, it's cumbersome. You know, the market can decide things better. So I think that's basically the sense in which I'm referring to neoliberalism. And it's a, f and it's a term, I think, that is reasonable as a characterization of both uh, Clinton and Bush and also in terms of the policies that have been imposed on the less developed countries, mainly through the U.S., and the conduits of those policies are the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the inter uh, I mean the uh, WTO, uh, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. They all believe in this notion of neoliberalism. Talk about w how our situation here, our e economy, relates to those entities. Uh, the WTO just had a ministerial down in right. Cancun, Mexico that collapsed, right. uh, not unlike our economy. Um, right. What's the uh, connection there? What do you see coming well, in the future? Well, I mean, the, there, the, we have a general crisis, uh, or maybe crisis isn't the right word because, you know, everything could be called a crisis. I mean, we have a fundamental problem in the world economy. Um, and, and it, we're undergoing this massive transition in which uh, poor countries, uh, most people in poor countries, for the first time in world history, are not earning their living off the land. They may, they may have scratched out a meager living, but that was how they earned their living. And increasingly, people in poor countries are coming into labor markets looking for jobs. And the question is whether their jobs are for them. 
And for the most part, the answer is not. And we have massive problems of unemployment in poor countries. Uh, the solution to that that comes out of neoliberalism, that comes out of the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization is, okay, you all, you need to develop efficient economies and the way to do that is to be successful exporters. Uh, so you start making things that we in the rich countries want to buy uh, and then you'll get rich too. Now, there's a couple of problems with that formulation, but one of them, and I, to me, may, maybe not the most important one, but certainly the one that led to the collapse of this Cancun discussion. One of them is that the rich countries like us in the U.S., we say this, you poor countries, you want to create more jobs for your people, start learning how to export and sell things in the markets for rich people. Uh, and a lot of the countries are saying, okay, fine, that's what, we're going to do it. You know, and anyway, you're not giving us any choice. You're telling us we have to do it or we don't ever get any loans. So we do it. Now we do it, but you still have trade barriers. You're telling us to do that, but you're still subsidizing your own agriculture. You're telling us to start exporting into your country. You're still subsidizing your own agriculture. You're still protecting your own uh, production of clothing. Uh, so that ain't fair. So lower your, t your barriers. If you're telling us we have to do this, then you have to give us a fair chance to get into your markets. Uh, that was the cause of the collapse of the Cancun meetings. Uh, to me, though, there's a deeper problem. And, and in a sense, what happened at Cancun is a reflection of the deeper problem. It is not the deeper problem itself, which is that in all cases, neoliberalism, again, is predicated on the idea of letting the markets work and, and creating an environment in which corporations and the wealthy get to decide things for everybody. Uh, that actually is a dramatic change from what went on uh, after the World War II and the Great Depression, which was government policy in both the rich countries and the poor countries and among those, the communist countries, government policy was really fundamentally targeted at creating jobs for people. That was their job. You know, we can run a, an economy that may be more or less capitalist, uh, but after the 30s, we know that capitalist economies have a tendency to pr produce massive problems of unemployment and everything that goes with that all the social anxiety, all the tensions, all the fighting over a shrinking pie. That was what nat Nazism was fundamentally about. They did, people didn't know what to do with themselves because they couldn't get jobs. So the problem with neoliberalism is that we tell governments, you can't be focused on creating jobs for people. You focus on creating a stable environment so that the businesses will come in and they will create the jobs on their own. That's true in the rich countries and the poor countries. And so the poor countries have not been able to focus on job creation for their people. They're focused on t what the IMF tells them to do, which is to create an environment in which multinationals want to come into your country, create an environment in which you can compete as an exporter, and the jobs will flow after that. But the jobs aren't flowing after that. So that in a country like South Africa, uh, you know, after this enormous historic struggle to overthrow apartheid and to put in place a non-racial democracy, which is one of the great achievements of the 20th century, no doubt. They now are faced with their neoliberal policies, which they follow. They're faced with 40% unemployment. And so all the enormous achievements of Mandela and the African National Congress are getting delegitimized by these neoliberal policies which do not allow this, these poor country governments to go to really fight and produce jobs for their people. So to me, the Cancun problem was, uh, the Cancun problem was, okay, we're going to do everything you tell us to do, but then you have to be fair. If you're telling us, let in the multinationals, make us ex uh, competitive for exports, that's, we're going to follow you down the line. But if we do that, then you have to let us into your markets fair and square, and you're not doing that. That's the Cancun debate. I would like to also address a, a deeper problem and say, 
you know, instead of telling the governments to just learn how to be exporters and just welcome multinationals, instead focus on creating jobs for your people. Let the government be aggressively focused on creating jobs for your people. That is a different concern, and we haven't got to the point where that has become the major concern. There's a lot of people that are saying the way that the people in charge in this country are steering the economy that they are turning the U.S. into a third world economy. Um, talk about whether well, there's, there's any truth to that and give us some solutions because I know your, your book focuses on, on actually fixing things right, as well. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's certainly true that the disparities in this country are getting more and more severe. Um, that, you know, uh, the, the difference between what an average worker gets and the corporate CEO, that it's gone from 30 to 1 in 1970 to 449 to 1 under Clinton in 2001. That's just one example. That uh, the minimum wage, which used to not, it was, it was certainly wasn't a princely sum, but it used to be something that if you earned a minimum wage job, uh, you could actually live above the poverty line. And if you actually adjusted for inflation, in 1968, the minimum wage was about $8.50 an hour throughout the whole country. That meant that if you went for a job at McDonald's and you were 16 years old, forget about you know people with families. The lowest paid worker on their first day of work, if the business was following the law, made about $8.50 an hour. Today it's five fifteen nationally. So uh, those are indicators of how these disparities have grown under both Clinton uh, Democrats and under Bush. And the assumptions of what government does for people have, have changed. Well, now we're experiencing the fiscal crisis in state and local governments. Um, in Portland, Oregon, last spring, they had to close down the schools early because of the fiscal crisis. We're starting to uh, think that things are luxuries that we took as, as basic foundations of a democratic society, like running a public school for a full year. Why should that be considered a luxury? Well, it's starting to be thought of as one. And the fiscal crisis is not confined to one state. I mean, we've just had this uh, absurd experience with a recall in California. Now, I'm no fan of Gray Davis, but the problems that California and Gray Davis faced are no different than what are being faced in my own state of Massachusetts and most other states. It's because taxes were cut uh, during the boom years in, at the state level. Every state did it. Why? Because it looks good. You know, you can say I cut taxes, but the, the, the excess of tax revenues were largely driven by this bubble economy, by the capital gains revenues. And so then when the c economy collapsed, then, of course, at lower tax rates, all the states are in crisis. So that, that the very notion of the public sector is uh, threatened, uh, is diminishing. Again, I know it firsthand from my own university, the University of Massachusetts. So in that sense, I, you know, I don't know if we want to say it's a third world economy, but the disparities uh, between what what an ordinary person would expect in terms of life opportunities and what the wealthy expect as life opportunities. Those disparities are growing quite dramatically and rapidly and did grow under Clinton. They're growing more under Bush. Now, what, what to do about it? Well, the very first thing I would say to do about it is to stop the cuts in the state and local governments. Uh, and instead of having these absurd debates, you know, and having people like Arnold Schwarzenegger come in as authorities on what should be done, the very first thing is that the federal government has the power to finance these deficits that the state and local governments are experiencing. The, the overall deficits of the state and local governments on the order of 80 to 100 billion dollars this year. Well, that number is almost exactly the same number as what Bush proposed for financing reconstruction in Iraq. It looks like that no, that amount of money is going to be found for Iraq. Why can't we find that money right now for the states? And there's no new fancy programs. Just say stop cutting the programs we have. Keep the public schools going keep our programs of uh, well-being, health programs of well-being and, and public safety programs in New York. They are cutting back, 
you know, the f fire stations, the heroes of 9-11 are, are losing their jobs. So that's, that's the very short-term thing that I would think about. The, the longer-term solutions that I go through in the book, and I go through them briefly, so hopefully, you know, this is not just for policy wonks. Hopefully ordinary people, uh, my own family, who are definitely not uh, econ economists or policy specialists, you know, they can actually read the book and get through it. My students, uh, hopefully people can get a flavor of what I'm talking about. The, the longer term things that I'm thinking about are to refocus the uh, uh, abilities of government policy to focus on, on jobs, uh, to create jobs for people, and to uh, stimulate economic growth and opportunities by refocusing uh, the powers of government on jobs, good jobs, decent jobs. Uh, and when you do that, other good things will happen because then you'll have, if more people have good jobs, you'll have more government revenues and they, uh, then you'll have a bigger public sector. Uh, that's, that's kind of the, the major focus. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, I, I want to see these these cuts and and overall what we would call the welfare state or the, the redistribution policies, things like public schools, things like uh, health, public safety. Those have to be restored. Now, uh, it's not hard to do any of those things. We know when we really want to pay for something, the money gets found, and we know that from what's happened over the last year with Iraq. Somehow, with all the economic problems, Bush found the money to pay for the war in Iraq and is now finding the money to give to his friends at Halliburton and other companies to uh, reconstruct Iraq, as it were. Whether they're going to succeed or not is another matter. But no problem finding the money. Uh, and so I think we need to focus on, on doing that. And we can find the money to do it. Uh, there are, you know, there are technical issues and so forth. One of the things that I, I'm concerned with is this notion of people think that having a government deficit, a federal government deficit, is a vice. It's a bad thing, and it's a virtue to have a surplus. Uh, that's just inaccurate. When the, when the Clinton administration was running surpluses the last couple of years and, and touting that as an achievement, that also meant that, you know, if you had a $200 billion surplus, that also meant there's $200 billion less money going to useful things. I mean, one of the things I show in the book, I say, you know, if we only took $20 billion of the $200 billion surplus, took it out of the surplus in the year 2000, we would have been able to create, uh, hire something like 100,000 more school teachers and create 5,000 new schools and give out 50,000 more scholarships to to poor students that want to go to college. So, you know, there's always a trade-off. And so I want us to get away from the idea that deficits are always bad and to focus on the real goals that we care about, which are not deficits or surpluses, but the well-being of people. So that's kind of the overall approach that I take in the last chapter of the book. We're almost out of time. What, uh, what final thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with? Well, I guess my overall thought is that... Uh, Everybody cares about the economy. All the polls say that people are very concerned about the state of the economy. And there's good reasons to be concerned about the state of the economy. Um, the, uh, the Bush administration, it seems to me, doesn't really have any solutions to the economy that we would consider as, as desirable uh, if we care about the well-being of everybody and not just the, the rich. And what I would uh, think that is that we need to start focusing and start don't don't get kind of hung up on on technical things that uh, they're difficult to understand. Like you know, is the deficit too big or is it too small? Uh, the real issue is uh, is our well-being being promoted? Is uh, our jobs being created? Are the things we care about? Uh, we do. I, most people do want a, a good public sector. We don't want to have to think that things like having a full school year uh, is a luxury. We want to we want to think that having decent public schools is something that we've built up over generations, and so that we need to fight for those things and extend those things. And there's absolutely no reason for people to say these these aren't affordable. They are affordable. It's just a matter of having the political will to make these the priority. 
We have been talking with Robert Pullen, who is author of Contours of Dissent, U.S. Economic Fractures, and the Landscape of Global Austerity. Robert, thank you for coming in today. Thanks very much for having me, Mike.